Good evening, and welcome to the UCLA Film and Television Archives Virtual Screening Room. I'm Mark Quigley, John H. Mitchell Television Curator for the Archive. Thank you for joining us for this special screening event and panel discussion, KCET TV Pioneers, Los Angeles Documentary in the 1970s. Before we begin, as a land-grant institution, the Film and Television Archive at UCLA would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples. We are humbled to do work in this community. Tonight's program is made possible thanks to the invaluable support of the John H. Mitchell Television Programming Endowment. Please note that this online screening is presented for educational purposes only, in keeping with UCLA's mission to serve the public and academia. No portion of this screening may be reproduced or redistributed in any manner whatsoever. This evening, we are extremely honored to have four highly esteemed guests with us. I'll start by introducing just one of them, our moderator, Dr. Joshua Glick. Dr. Glick is a visiting associate professor of film and electronic arts at Bard College and the author of the essential book, Los Angeles Documentary and the Production of Public History, published by the University of California Press. Dr. Glick's articles and reviews have appeared in numerous journals, including Film Quarterly, Jump Cut, and The Moving Image. He recently co-curated an exhibition at the Museum of the Moving Image titled Deepfake, Unstable Evidence on Screen. And his current book project explores how the rising interest in nonfiction on both sides of the political spectrum has transformed the relationship between Hollywood, Silicon Valley, and Washington, DC. We have an excellent program in store for you tonight with important television films and their highly gifted makers waiting in the wings. So without further delay, I hand the reins over to Dr. Glick. Thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Glick. This virtual broadcast is now yours. Thank you, Mark Quigley, for that kind introduction, for curating the lineup of programs, and for convening this important event. And a special note of gratitude goes to the UCLA Film and Television Archive for their dedication to preserving and making available so many TV series and standalone films from KCET, Los Angeles's public media affiliate. It's really an honor and a pleasure to be participating in this screening and talk back. We're about to view three documentaries from the 1970s by three visionary filmmakers, Jesus Trevino, Lynn Littman, and the Reverend Dr. Tendeka, who at the time of making films for KCET went by the name Sue Booker. I should note that these individuals will be joining us for a conversation after the films. Trevino, Littman, and Tendeka shared the idea that cinema in general and documentary in particular could serve as both an artful form of social advocacy and have a community building function. Their documentaries aim to give voice to marginalized Angelinos whose very identities were severely distorted or ignored within the mainstream media. So too, these filmmakers align their nonfiction projects with the social movements sweeping Los Angeles and reverberating around the country. The city was at once the site of severe racial segregation and class stratification and a hotbed of activism as the African-American civil rights movement gave way to the Black, Chicano, women, and Asian-American liberation movements, as well as calls to attend to the city's underserved elderly population, as we will see. Trevino, Littman, and Tendeka all worked together at KCET's Human Affairs Department. The department, which was created in 1970, and the larger launch of public television emerged by way of a constellation of social pressures and the progressive actions of individuals. There are four significant factors that I want to highlight. First, the grassroots labor by citizen groups and advocacy organizations demanding increased access to the means of media production for marginalized communities. A major critique was that for-profit network broadcasting had failed to address the concerns of the nation's diverse populace, and there needed to be new, inclusive outlets with the reinvigorated social mandate. Second, the release of Linda B. Johnson's Kerner Commission report, which is in, it, in its attempt to better understand the wave of urban uprisings throughout the 1960s, discovered that minority communities found mass media alienating, deeply racist, and felt profoundly frustrated by an egregious lack of representation on screen, on the airwaves, and in electoral politics. Third, there were the crucial efforts of, film, of the filmmakers themselves who were eager to make their own projects. They were motivated less by the prospects of commercial success or fame than by the urgent social utility of cinema. 
they drew on a burgeoning global film culture while never losing sight of the specificity of the socio-political struggles with which they were engaged. And fourth, there was the work of KCET personnel. This included programming director Charles Allen, who was instrumental in pulling resources together to create the Human Affairs Department. Allen was able to use his position of power within the public media infrastructure to help make space for bold and incisive filmmaking. And now for our triple feature of short films that we're going to watch. First up is an episode from Tendaka's Doing It at the Storefront. Broadcast from a KCET satellite studio in Watts, the series constituted a brilliant experiment in community media as the show was embedded within one of the city's most vibrant African-American neighborhoods. Everyone on staff from the intern to the office administrator plays an on-screen role in the production. Doing it at the storefront looked at such pressing issues as housing, healthcare, and the black arts movement on a local and national level. In our featured episode, we see Tendeka interview Tony Brown, executive director of the national PBS series, Black Journal. The two enjoy a spirited discussion about the important past, present and anxious future of Black-centric programming. Our second film is Jesus Trevino's America Tropical. The documentary explores the history and contemporary efforts to preserve the Mexican artist Alfred Siqueiros' famous Alvarez Street mural in downtown Los Angeles. Created in 1932 as a statement about U.S. imperialism and the oppression of indigenous peoples across the Americas, the mural was quickly whitewashed. Through interviews, sepia-toned archival photographs, and striking views of America Tropical itself, Trevino's documentary excavates the mural's past, the legacy of Siqueiros' revolutionary fresco practice, and reflects on the importance of the visual arts to present-day Chicanx culture and political consciousness. We'll conclude with Lynn Littman's Number Our Days, a poignant portrait of the elderly Jewish population residing in Venice. Working in partnership with anthropologist Barbara Meyerhoff, Littman embraced a cinema verite style of observational cinematography and intimate interviews to capture the daily rituals and routines of the aging Venice residents. In the film, the Israel Levin Senior Adult Center, located right on the boardwalk, serves as the social hub for everything from high holy day meals to birthday celebrations and funeral ceremonies. Not simply a romantic take on old age, Number Our Days highlights the efforts of center members to make themselves visible to each other in a city that so often neglects their very existence, as the prospects of displacement due to rising gentrification is a constant threat. Collectively, these three documentaries and the larger body of work by Tandeka, Trevino, and Littman transformed private memories into public history, helping residents to talk to themselves, about themselves, and bolstering feelings of pride and dignity. Their documentaries mobilize support against systemic forces of injustice, connecting local struggles within Los Angeles to broader social movements within and even beyond the U.S. Please stay with us after the screening as we'll have a Zoom conversation with the filmmakers. It promises to be a vibrant dialogue. So we just saw a powerful trio of films, and it's really a privilege to be here right now with the filmmakers. Uh, Reverend Dr. Tandeka, Jesus Trevino, and Lynn Littman. And we're excited to discuss your important work. Um, perhaps we could begin by, by hearing from each of the filmmakers um, about uh, the, the projects that, that we just saw. Um, Tendeka, uh, you and Tony Brown um, were having an extended dialogue about really the, the world of, of Black broadcasting. Um, in your thoughts, did doing it at the storefront, share some of the same hopes and, and challenges as, as Black Journal? Um, and if you could maybe just reflect on what were some of the central aims of doing it at the storefront? Well, yes, thank you. I'm so glad to be with you. The storefront was a communication center for the liberation of Black people. It functioned as a news and public affairs bureau for South Central Los Angeles. It was also the staging area for remote interviews. And always the goal was to transform consciousness so that we could transform the world. Tony said that his program wasn't really about Black people, but people who had a chance to be people who happened to be Black. 
I felt the same way about the storefront. My parents, mm -hmm. after all, had their grandparents were enslaved persons. So being in front of television, a television camera without blackface and with all of our dignity and discovering what's new was a revolution in itself. And as Gil Scott Heron said, the revolution will not be televised, it will be live. And my task was to get the camera there so that we could watch it unfold in real time. Thank you for that. Um, Jesus, uh, America Tropical, it intertwines a cultural history of the Siqueiros mural with a contemporary account of the Chicanx art movement. Um, I'm curious, what was the origin of, of the documentary? I mean, how, how did you come to the project in the first place? Well, I had heard from uh, a friend of mine who was an art historian, Dr. Schiffer Goldman, had told me uh, that there was this mural in downtown Los Angeles on Olvera Street that had been painted in 1932 by the Mexican muralist David Alfaro Siqueiros. And um, I couldn't believe it. I wanted to go see it. So she and I climbed up on the roof and there it was. And of course, uh, the mural had been whitewashed in 1932 because of this controversial uh, nature. It, it, it depicted a Native American um, uh, crucified on a double cross and on top of the cross was the eagle from the United States currency. So it was Siqueiros' commentary on um, US imperialism. Uh, and it, like I said, it lasted for about a week or two in Los Angeles after its unveiling, and then it was whitewashed. And when I heard about it, I thought, geez, I, I got to do a story about this. At the time, um, I didn't have the skills. So a couple of years had to pass. And then I was working at KCET, and um, I took uh, the station manager, Chuck Allen, uh, one evening after dinner to, to go visit and view the mural. And once he saw the mural, he said, my gosh, you, you, you should do a movie about this. And I said, well, that's wh why we're here. Uh, I want your approval. And in those days, KCT was a very exciting uh, place uh, because um, you could do that. You, you, you'd come up with an idea, you were a producer, and you came up with an idea. And um, if it had legs, you'd get the go ahead, the green light, and you could go forward and do that. I'm very proud about America Tropical because it wound up um, starting a Save the Mural Committee. And from that committee, another 40 years later, the Getty Museum wound up uh, spending $10 million to refurbish that mural, all originating from this documentary. Oh, wow. It's fantastic. And, and, Lynn Littman, we'll, we'll go to you and then maybe we ha I have some follow-up questions for, for, for each of you as well, because um, what you're saying is, I think, pointing in a number of different directions about these fabul fabulous films. Um, but for Lynn, I mean, one could imagine a, a kind of expository documentary about the history of the elderly Jewish community, but you really opted for a kind of cinema verite uh, portrait um, of this community in, in the present. There's interviews, there's uh, you know, observational sequences. Um, and I'm curious how you gained access um, to, to the community and, and how did you decide what to focus on for this film? Well, thank you. Number of our days were sort of an accident because we, were, we had full-time jobs, the three of us. We had to get reports or stories or films on the air every week. And that means that we, we were we were pretty busy in the middle of doing a weekly show or a, however often every two weeks. I think I got a film on the air every two weeks. It was, and I look at it now and it's absolutely extraordinary that that happened. Yeah. We worked, we worked full time. We were very young and undistracted and that was quite handy. Anyway, back to number of days. I met Barbara Meyerhoff at a conference at the women's building. And I heard her talking about her work um, in Venice with the old Jews um, because she basically had been kicked out of Mexico 
because it was a period of time, perhaps it's happening again now, where you basically had to do academic work about the community that you were part of and outsiders were not welcome. So she left, left her Latin American studies and went to Venice Beach and found the old Jews. And her, her research, she hadn't written her book yet. She wrote her book after we finished filming. Her research was quite extensive so that filming the selected, I, I almost picked from a menu of scenes that mm. she had already researched. People spoke spontaneously. It wasn't, and besides which they were old enough not to remember what they'd said before anyway. So, um, <laughs> um, um, we had quite a wonderful time. We had different backgrounds, Dr. Meyerhoff and myself. She came from the from I think from Chicago, and not a very not a very Jewish family at all. And I came from New York with a with a Yiddish speaking grandmother. So I had all the inside stuff, and she had all the outside stuff. And it was a very wonderful collaboration, completely wonderful collaboration. How lucky! And, and we snuck it in. We snuck it in between the weekly reports that we're doing at KCET. So it was, it was quite a schizophrenic period, but it was wonderful. I'm so jealous of us. <laughs> I'm jealous as well. I mean, it's such a vibrant time. Um, I mean, a number of you have already sort of mentioned, you know, what it was like to work in KCET and, and a little bit about how you came um, to work at the station. We'll get to that in one minute, but I just thought, um, just given everything that you've said, if I could ask maybe just a couple of follow-up questions. So for for Lynn, uh, were they ever resistant? I mean, were the subjects in the film, the individuals that you talked to, were any of them resistant to being on camera or, you know, or, or did any of, or, or, you know, perhaps quite the opposite, you know, did they quite really, the you know, take to the stage? Yeah. Quite the opposite. They were delighted to be on camera. In fact, it kept them, I think it kept them awake, although a contentious group that was quite familiar to me. Um, so I wasn't intimidated by them because they, they were an intimidating crowd. They were absolutely not shy, very anxious to be photographed and, um, and not, they were performing themselves. It wasn't, mm. it wasn't anything fake. They were performing themselves. Amazing. Wow. And for Jesus, um, for America Tropical, I mean, it combines so many different approaches to cinema. I, I mean, there are, there are moments of, of archival documents. There's flashes of, of voiceover. Um, there's, you know, on location shots of the mural itself. And I'm just curious how you, thought about a, a, a cinematic approach um, to that project and what to do. I mean, how to bring and braid all of those different techniques together. Well, I, I, I wanted to tell not just the story of something that had happened in 1932, uh, but also what was happening in 1969 and 70, mm -hmm. the Chicano community, which was there was a revolution going on. And, um, and uh, for me, the, the fact that this whitewashed uh, wall was emerging once more, that mm -hmm. the sun and the elements had worn away the, the uh, whitewash and this image was emerging, to me was uh, em emblematic of what was going on in the Chicano community where our own history that had been obliterated and occluded was now emerging as we Chicano activists were making it emerge and manifesting who we were. So to me, it was very metaphoric in that sense. And that's what inspired me to do it. And technically, um, you know, I'd done a, lo a, a lot of documentary type work on um, um, K at KCET um, with a program called Aora. And I knew the history and I felt that had to be a part of it. But more importantly, mm -hmm. we had to tell the story of what was going on now. Yeah. I mean, and this is maybe just a, a question for, for, for each of you. I mean, were there um, particular cinematic influences or media influences that you found inspirational that you brought to these projects in particular or your filmmaking practice more generally? I mean, I, I know it was, it was such an intense, expansive time, um, you know, for, for film culture. Were there any yeah, directors, programs, or 
other folks you look to? Yeah. I, I mean, and this is maybe just a, a question for, for, for each of you. I mean, were there um, particular cinematic influences or media influences that you found inspirational that you brought to these projects in particular or your filmmaking practice more generally? I mean, I, I know it was, it was such an intense, expansive time, um, you know, for, for film culture. Were there any yeah, directors, programs, or other folks you look to? For me, it was all about camera placement. Mm -hmm. Where was I going to place the camera? I went to, I graduated from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism in 1968, and the revolution was already underway to ask the man who was on the street with the police officer standing over him to put the microphone in front of the man on the street and ask him to tell us his story. So that was mm. the, sh the placement of the camera was already an issue. And thus in the storefront, you never knew from one week to another what kind of show you were going to see. Sometimes it was drama, documentary, theater, dance, whatever was going on, we would figure out a way to enhance it and broadcast it so that you could in this way have a sense of the revolution unfolding before you. So in terms of camera mm -hmm. placement, this story comes to mind. There was a young lady named, a little girl actually named Gloria Griffith, who was perhaps 12 years old. She was quite petite. She had a baseball bat and two Los Angeles police officers assumed that she was trying to attack them. So they shot her 28 times. The black community was incensed and 28 different organizations came together. Some of the organizations didn't like the others organizations, but this was such an outrageous act that the 28 organizations decided they were going to work together and march on the precinct to demand justice. This was a huge news event. So the cameras from all the stations were there and all of them except mine were on the other side of the street. So the mm. camera's perspective said, what an odd looking bunch of people. Where are they going? What's going on? Huh, let's try to figure out what's happening. I place my cameraman in the middle of the march so that already through camera placement, you were angry, upset and demanding justice. Mm. So the key for me was perspective. Yeah. I, I mean, if I could just ask one quick follow-up question about that, Tandeka. I mean, you mentioned camera placement, which seems absolutely crucial, but it's also, it seems like the placement and the position of, of the studio. I mean, you, you had the doing it the storefront, you know, operating as, as a kind of a satellite, you know, studio um, in South Central. And I'm just curious if you could say maybe a word or two about, about that, you know, about having a studio that was separate from the main facility. I imagine that was yes. not common at the time. That's right. I asked Chuck Allen if indeed I could set up a bureau because I wanted Black LA to have its own bureau as oh. a invitation or perhaps a forerunner of a Black network. My dream was to create such fabulous television programming and surprising programming with commercials from street theater companies and the rest that it would go really big, we would get backers. And then once the storefront in Los Angeles was going very well, I would move to another city, do it over again, so that perhaps in five or 10 years, there would be 10 or 15 storefronts. And then all of us would pull back from the mothership link up together and we'd have our first black network. Why that didn't happen is part of the story. Perhaps we will get into later in this discussion because I discovered that there were two other kinds of things I had to focus on in order to completely tell the story about a people who have been dis distressed and are seeking liberation through love and compassion. Mm. Now, if, if I could just add, one of the th yeah. points that Deika makes is at the time, and she and I would have these long conversations um, as she and I shaped each other's outlook on what we needed to do as black and brown people for our community. And one of the things that we hit on was that the, tele the, the, the station had a way of relegating us to one corner. 
and they had uh, they had they had programs that were musical programs. We weren't usually a part of that. We were, there was programs that were news. There were programs that were cultural, and then there were black shows, her show and my show, the Chicano show, Acción Chicano. But what both Tandeca and I hit on was, wait a minute, our community isn't bifurcated that way, isn't separated that way. Our community has musicians, has culture, has all these things, and we need to do shows that reflect all of our community, all aspects of it. I'd and like that, to add, some, yes, I'd like to add something here. I never, ever felt relegated at KCET, ever. And the department we were in was called the Human Affairs Department, which I thought was magnificent. But there was an extraordinary freedom here, God bless Chuck Allen, so that I could do whatever I wanted to do to get the message across, which is why for the storefront, we were all over the place. Drama, theater, you know, documentaries, whatever was going on, we could do. So perhaps, Chewy, you felt relegated. I never felt relegated. What I meant, neither did I. Neither did I. What I meant was that the station had departments, and they didn't have until we created it. They didn't have a department for you or a department for me. Yes, and they put us in human affairs, which was magnificent. Yeah, and and wanted to get out of it. We wanted to create our own stuff. Remember, as human beings, yes. Sorry, Lynn, Lynn, were you going to say something? I saw your... Well, no? the old Jews, for me, were family. And my camera placement was loving. Um, they were in their 80s and 90s. Um, they were stubborn and intense and very often pain, pains in the ass or pain in the asses or whatever. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to make them, as they were to me, they were sympathetic, they were my grandparents. And the irony is I brought my mother down there once to visit and they didn't get along so well with her because she was their daughter. It skipped a generation, the affection and the ease and the openness skipped a yeah. generation. Um, so she wasn't enormously sympathetic until the film came out, of course. Um, but most of the work I did at KCT was about the women's movement. And mm -hmm. it was um, full. N nobody was competitive with me for the subject. Um, it, it <laughs> um, each, each piece was a, was a sort of a put down of, of, of the abuse or the, in, what, what's the word? The ignorance about women and women's art, women's culture, women's emotional stuff. One piece of filming I did at the women's building was so offensive to our crew that they took their names off the show, which was quite amazing. Um, the piece was called Woman House is Not a Home, and mm -hmm. they objected to Judy Chicago's artwork, and Rick Benowitz removed his name from the credits. And I was stunned. I was stunned that that my my people would be so alienated by the subject. It was extraordinary. Actually, it was a very good lesson. I have to yeah. add something here um, for the series that preceded the storefront called um, "Doing It," which was a ten-part series for KCET that was then broadcast over PBS. One of the series was a drama. One program was a drama of the evolution of four African-American men in their individual cells, one next to each other in a prison. And so you watch gradually over the progress of the hour and a half, the evolution of each of these men. Because the question I wanted to ask was, why are so many of our revolutionaries coming from emerging from prisons? So, and the Watts, the Watts uh, poets were the voiceovers and they played part of the, some of the characters. I mean, it was really quite a powerful piece. And at the very end, the four men ex ex stick their 
hands between the bars and they say together, victory, victory, victory will be my moan. And then you have the credits. Okay. So the crew goes to Casey, to, <laughs> to Chuck Allen <laughs> and said, do you know what she's done? We can't air this. <laughs> Chuck loved it. PBS loved it, but several stations refused to broadcast that particular episode. Wow. Oh, wow. And on that note, can, can you all maybe uh, speak a little bit more about the reception um, of, of perhaps these programs as well as your work more generally? I mean, I know there was such a, an intense local focus, but your programs, your films were really resonating across the country. Well, you know, one thing that Tandeka says uh, brings to mind, um, we did a show, uh, you know, concurrent, as, as Lynn was saying, concurrent with our regular output of doing this report of something that was going on in Los Angeles. Um, we each had our own, you know, Tandeka had the storefront and, uh, and I had uh, Acción Chicano. We had, now we were producing a weekly show. And the weekly shows were often talking heads, but a lot of times there were drama or whatever. We had one show that was a theater company from Mexico City that had come to Los Angeles, and they did a performance, and some of the songs were so revolutionary, a la Che Guevara, that <laughs> when it aired, the uh, KCT phone lines lit up like a Christmas tree. And it was all very, very irate conservative Cubans who were outraged oh, wow. that we were doing these revolutionary songs on public television. And it was just hilarious to see this uh, outcome of, of this, but uh, only to say that um, we had to juggle, as, as Lynn was saying, we had to juggle between our, our personal assignments that we wanted to do and, and then what we had to do for the station because it was at beyond this Friday and we had to edit it and all of that by, by then. And going back just for a moment on what you were uh, asking about, you know, Tandeka talking about placement of camera, to me, another huge, huge aspect was the editing. And we had great, mm. we had, we had uh, you know, Dick Davies and Barry Nye and these great uh, editor cameramen that would go out on assignment with Lynn or with Tandeka or with myself. And would and would come back and they put these shows you know we'd look over their shoulders and we'd work together but there was great great creativity going on there so uh, I must say that I, I think all of us owe them a great deal of credit as well. There was a there was a very there was a a a, a situation a, a mood um an ex I don't even know what to call it at the station that was so amazing. Um, we respected each other. Um, mm. It was a group of people, we were, we were good and we respected each other. We, we, the unusualness of that only became clear to me as I, in later years, as I left and worked in places where, where I felt like the only person in the world. I mean, um, there was a there was an amazing it is Chuck Allen's re responsibility. He put together an extraordinary group of people, and I'm not tooting our horns, although we deserve to be tooted. But um, but we respected each other, and that's an, an that's a really important thing. Well, one thing I have to mention about Chuck, um, my interview, and I think this may apply to others. Uh, with Chuck Allen for for the job was he asked me, what are you reading now? Mm. And we got into a long discussion about literature. And he wanted to know these things about us in order to be able to determine whether we were going to be able to do good programming or not. And that to me oh, wow. was... I have a story about oh. Chuck. Oh, go ahead, Lynn. Excuse me. Yeah. Well, I have a funny story. I got hired by threatening his secretary. I, I had met him once and he seemed quite interested in hiring me. And a couple of months later, I tried to get in touch with him and couldn't get through. And I knew he valued his secretary because I'd met her. And I called her up and threatened her and said, I'm going to call you every 15 minutes until Chuck gets on the phone. And I did. I probably went on for about three or four hours. 
And finally he got on the phone and hired me. <laughs> but my oh, wow. God, you, I think of who that person was, me, and I think of who that, the craziness of our, of our braveness. We were, we were young and silly and brave and, and yes. how amazing. Here's my favorite Chuck Allen story. The storefront was, I don't know, a half hour show, maybe an hour. I can't remember. I guess it was about half a, yes, a half hour show. So anyway, if a huge event took place in the community and I felt the revolution was going to be televised, I had to go there and I had a strict budget. But I told Barry Nye, the filmmaker, to bring all the cans of film on hand. And I covered a three and a half hour news event in which the gangs were there, all the organizations were there. They were all making speeches. They were all trying to figure out what to do. Angela Davis was there. Everyone was there. And by the end, most of the people had left and the gangs now took over. They came on stage because they hadn't been invited. So there we were still filming. Right? <laughs> Barry ran out of film. So I went back to the studio. Chuck called me into the front office screaming. How can you do this? You're way over budget. You didn't have a budget for this. You didn't ask me if you could do this. So I started screaming back at him. I said, this is a black revolution. How dare you object to this? <laughs> we went back and forth for about five minutes and then he said, go away. <laughs> Well, aired wow. for the whole three and a half hours aired. <laughs> That's Chuck Allen. That was Chuck Allen. Another time, um, early on, there was a big discussion about whether um, I would be just a staff producer for KCT as part of their, I think it was called the LA Collective at the time, mm -hmm. or whether yeah. I could have my own show. And at the time, I was very adamant that we had to have, we Chicanos had to have our own show. And at one point, uh, and Chuck disagreed. And then I had to make my point that I really felt strongly about this. So I walked in with a letter and the letter was signed by every Latino at KCET. And the letter said that unless we had our own show, all of us were going to resign in mass and we would pick at the station. And Chuck Allen's response was, I don't like to have a gun put to my head. You'll have your damn show. Uh. <laughs> and it looks like the three of us, the three of us threatened our way into the into work. <laughs> it was effective, for sure. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're describing such a, a special place, such a vibrant place at, at a really crucial moment. And, and Chuck Allen is, you know, is definitely part of this. I'm curious how each of you came to KCET. You know, you had been working in, in, in film or around film or broadcasting um, in years prior. And I'm curious if you could just each reflect on, um, you know, how you found your way essentially to KCET and to the Human Affairs Department. Yes, I love my story. I began at uh, Children's Television Workshop before Sesame was, Street was created. I was the production assistant, assistant to the producers who created Sesame Street and uh, the electric company. But I knew that I wanted to do documentaries, to create documentaries on the history of the Black experience in this country. So I ended up working as a producer and director for a PBS series called The Black Frontier. Hmm. And everyone uh, based in uh, Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, KUON TV, had gotten the grant from PBS to do the show. So Chuck Allen had been hired by the executive producer who was white and a football player. And perhaps this was the first program he'd ever really produced. <laughs> so Larry was his name, had hired Chuck as an advisor. So Larry and I flew out to California, to KCET, and met Chuck in his office to get his advice, because this was going to be a docudrama, four docudramas on the history of the Black West. Wow. So Larry went on and on and on and on, making absolutely 
no sense whatsoever. Chuck and I began to communicate <laughs> silently, <laughs> saying things like, Chuck said, is this guy for real? And I said, no, not at all. This went back and forth <laughs> for 10 or 15 minutes. Then Larry had to go to the bathroom. And Chuck said to me while he was gone, stay in touch, <laughs> keep in touch. So when the one you know year gig was over and the shows were broadcast, I wrote to Chuck saying, okay, now I'm free. And he said, come on to LA and be a television producer. And that's when I met uh, Tandeka. Um, I had worked with KCT. Uh, they had a, a uh, what is it? A test program called um, Aora, and we did um, uh, I think um, what uh, sixty uh, half-hour live shows. And then Chuck Allen, um, uh, we had a satellite studio in East LA. When that program ended, Chuck hired me, and I think our first meeting uh, as my new position as associate producer was to meet Tandeka, and we both. We both walked into Chuck Allen's office. He introduced us to, to one another. And little did we know that um, we, we, we had a really good discussion with him. And we're walking outside of KCET and there are these two brown VWs, 1969 VWs parked next to each other on Vine Street. And one belonged to me and one belonged to Tandeka. And we knew from then on that we would be longtime friends. Plus, one more thing, even though I'm quite a bit older than Jesus, <laughs> uh, I, I was born I'm, one I'm day old. before Chewy. <laughs> we're birthday wow. twins. That was the moment of bonding when we said, my God, we're, we're born a day apart, too? Wow. 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 I didn't know that. Wow. Well, I came there because I spent a good deal of time at NET in New York and loved it and worked worked as an associate producer, peon, whatever, at anything jack of all trades there for several years and worked on several wonderful documentaries, um, a follow-up to Edward R. Murrow's What Harvest for the Reaper. Um, we, did, we did wonderful work. And so I, when I got to California, um, it was natural. I wanted to be in public television. Also, I wasn't quite aware of it because I'd never really worked in any commercial organization, but public television allowed women to work in the same way men did. As a matter of fact, at NET in New York, there were many more powerful women than men. And I didn't, I wasn't attuned to it until quite later when I went to work at ABC for 364 days, that, that that is an unbelievable gift. It shouldn't be, but it is, and it was, and, 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 and we, all, we all thrived there. For our different reasons in our different styles, we thrived. What, it, was like a, it, was, it was like a fictional movie. We, we said we, we, could, we could go and pick up a camera crew and go out and shoot. It was, there was nothing like it. There's been nothing like it in my life since then. That's for sure. Mm. And if each of you could maybe reflect on, just to go back to that, that question of, of, of feedback, of, of resonance, of, of reception, I do want to uh, make sure we have time for you all to, to reflect on your, your more recent work. But if there is um, a sense, and, and I'm, I'm hearing this in, in each of your reflections right now, that the projects you worked on, they were standalone programs, they were on KCET, they were broadcast both locally as well as, and in some cases nationally. What kind of feedback were you getting um, from the communities you were representing? I mean, you mentioned maybe phone calls, were there letters? Did you hear directly? My all time favorite letter was from a woman, a black Muslim, who watched the movie I told you about, the drama, Victory Will Be My Moan. Mm -hmm. And she wrote a letter saying, I do not know whether you are black or white, 
but Allah will bless you. Thank you. Oh. I think we picked up Emmys every year, the three of us, working on, on joint shows. I mean, we I I have three local Emmys and I'm and you must have them too, because we all got them for this for these these group shows that we did. Um so we were very well received within the professional community. Um we didn't, I don't know that we had anything to do with anybody. We were just working like animals. Um, I mean, the, the, old, the old Jews um, wound up getting out into the world and winning an Oscar, but it, had, it came from local, local love. I never mm. worked on the magazine show. So I have one Emmy and five nominations and a citation. Wow. When Victory Will Be My Moan was nominated for an Emmy, one of the judges came up to me before the ceremony and said, I loved your program, but you don't have a snowball's chance in hell of winning the award. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. unbelievable. <laughs> that it was such love and affection. There was just, you know, there were almost tears in his eyes. <laughs> oh, hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, I mean, just from looking back over the press reports and the coverage, I mean, so many local awards, national awards, and even how it was re being reported um, in publications at the time. I mean, there were reviews, there were accounts, there were interviews. I mean, it was something that was sort of resonating, um, you know, within Los Angeles and, and, and in publications, um, both per se, um, you know, the African American community, the Chicanx community, but also just mainstream news periodicals. You know, we're covering this stuff as well, which was a really, you know, a pr pretty extraordinary um, effort. Just, um, just that, um, you know, I, 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 I was, of course, getting feedback from the Latino community, but uh, for for Accent Chicano, we patterned our shows around what was going on in the community. So, if mm -hmm. anything, all we, all for the most part, I got was uh, a reinforcement. That we were doing the right thing that we were reporting on the issues and concerns that that community wanted to, to know about so i felt very good about that um and of course um on on a broader scale i think we were uh fulfilling uh chuck uh, chuck allen's mandate uh i remember early on um Tandek and i asked him well what kind of show should we be doing this was very early on uh, in our association or in human affairs. And he said, I don't care what you do. Because we said, you know, is this going to be a weekly show, a monthly show? What, what kind of show do you And he said, I don't care what it is as long as it wins awards. And that was our man, win awards. You see, I heard something else, which was, I heard him say, do what you want to do. I don't know. Just do what you want to do. That's what I heard. Wow. That was my takeaway. Okay. It sounds like a supportive producer. Yeah, I mean, a, a, across really multiple made, fronts. He was fabulous, absolutely fabulous. And each of us loved him in our own respective ways. I mean, he was just fabulous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have one very <laughs> funny um, community involvement story, which you must feel free to cut away, to cut out. And that is that I had done a film, I was doing a film about the Feminist Women's Health Center. And it went on the air and it was quite well received. And about a month after the film was on the air, I found myself at the Feminist Women's Health Center getting an abortion from exactly the person whom I had filmed two months earlier. And it was quite an amazing experience. Thank you for that story. That's powerful, Lynn. It That's was quite powerful. It was amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And that goes back to your ode to the Venice Jews, which was, as Barbara said, I'm interviewing myself. <laughs> I now know who I will be when I grow old. And the tragedy is that she died at 49. Oh, true, sure, yeah. I did a film about her dying called In Her Own Time. Mm -hmm. I saw it. It was beautiful. Yeah. Yes, it was. A, it was. That was a very difficult thing to do. Oh um, my God! She trusted me. She trusted me so completely. Um, she she lived just long enough to see a final cut. 
She didn't see it on the air, but she saw the final cut. Mm. That, that is a powerful film for, for sure. Sorry, Lynn, were you going to say you look like you're right on the cusp of about to say no, something? No, it was about it was about a follow up study she had done about the Orthodox Jews in, on Fairfax. Yeah, in Fairfax. It was, it was mixing up her work and her life, which was her gift. She was quite scolded by the anthropology on the anthropology the anthropology community um because she didn't follow strict objective rules indeed she was completely immersed with her subject and that's where her mm -hmm. poetry came from yeah. it was i mean definitely a, a powerful anthropologist author artist i mean really worked across media and, and i think when you you know came together to work with her in really incredible ways. I mean, in, in Number of Our Days was, I think, a powerful film and then um, in her own time as well. I, I wanna give a little bit of space in this conversation right now um, for you all to reflect on some of your more contemporary projects. I know you each in your own way were sort of draw, you know, taking things that you worked on um, at this moment forward across other forms of media, intersecting with other institutions. And just an opportunity right now, if you want to share um, anything you've been working on um, lately or um, in the years following KCET. I'd like to share what I'm working on now as a link to the storefront and the work that I did at KCET and the work that brought me into television and production to begin with. One of the things I do believe is that if you're a good journalist, the world starts falling apart for you because you can no longer separate the good guys from the bad guys anymore. <laughs> Us and them just kind of breaks down as you begin to see the nuance and the, the compromises people have to make in order to stay sane or to go insane with dignity. And so I went back to school because I realized that there was something that I did not yet understand about human beings that I must understand in order to be a better journalist, which was how was it that people hurt each other even when they don't want to? How do we lose our empathy and compassion and how do we get it back? And so three books later and a PhD and the rest, I've finally arrived at some answers and working with brain scientists as well, the founder of the Brain Science of Emotions. I've created a series called Universal Connections, which if you go to the YouTube channel and just Google in universal, YouTube Universal Connections season one, you'll have a sense of where I'm working now to make sense of how emotions are lost and how we get them back and how this work transforms us and our communities so that together we can heal and transform the world. And thus one final point here, who was it that said, um, you only need the anthropologist who said Margaret Mead, a small group of people can change the world. Whoever said a small group of people can't change the world is the only thing that can. I simply add one phrase to that, which is that you need more than one group. So the work that I'm doing now is to create small groups that will network together to heal and transform the world. It, it, it makes me think of what you're talking about as sort of individual stations sort of networked together, you know, to form, um, you know, a, a larger kind of constellation that can bring about forms of social change and heightened consciousness yes. and things like that. Yes, yes. Spot oh, on. Yeah. How wonderful. How wonderful. Mm. Wow. And anyone else? Want to... um, you know, since since KCT, um, at KCT, I, I, I wanted to to uh, become a narrative director. In addition to the documentary side and over the past 45, 50 years, I've been able to do both. Um, the the uh, episodic work I've done um, is satisfying in a certain way, uh, but in terms of uh, wanting to do something for my community, 
I found that it's not that practical to go, to think of a commercial way of doing it. And I've been doing it more on my own. So I continued doing documentaries on my own. And the latest manifestation since I've retired from TV directing uh, has been my website, latinopia.com. Mm -hmm. And what I do with Latinopia is a, a video driven website on Latino art, literature, music, theater, cinema, food. And basically I do interviews and uh, showcase Latino artists and musicians and poets and actors and, and directors. And um, I've got more than 600 videos on there. And this is my way of giving back to the Latino community and, uh, and still keeping my hand in, uh, in the medium. Also mention your novels. Okay. And also I'm, I just, I've been writing and uh, I've got, uh, you know, three collections of short stories, a memoir and a novel. Uh, and so um, I've been, I've been busy. <laughs> wow. Hey, hey, Seuss just blew my, 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 <laughs> my excuse. I was going to say, I haven't been active in the community. What I did learn after KCET, because I did, five dramatic films, um, one especially testament about the end of the world mm -hmm. due to nuclear, yeah. nuclear holocaust. Um, what I learned, as much as I was enjoyed doing them, I learned that uh, for me, what happens with a dramatic film is that you empty out, you give everything, and what happens with the documentary is that you fill up that you're being given. And mm -hmm. it's quite, it's quite hugely different. And the documentary for me was far more re rewarding. Um, far more rewarding. Um, I've just been doing, I've been collecting writings that I've done for the last 30 years and seeing if I was a person then. <laughs> and I'm not sure. You're definitely a person. I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. No, those those writings were great. And I mean, that's a really, I mean, insightful, eloquent sort of way of, of thinking about documentary and its relation to fiction and sort of what what it means to sort of work in, in each of those practices. Um, I, I'm curious. I, I mean, as you I all just were. Add one thing? Oh, yeah. Go for then... it. Yes. Go for it. Please. The day after is still vivid in my mind all these years later. It's a magnificent document. The day after yeah. wasn't mine. Mine was called Testament. Oh, I saw yours, though. Interesting. I've combined the two. Because well, they, I was they by came out at exactly the same time. The day after was done commercially for, for um, ABC. Okay. And, and mine was done for public television. Bravo again, public television for the yes. American, American Playhouse. Wonderful. Okay. And there's, you know, there's so much, I think, rich work from, you know, each of you. I mean, whether it's working in the short form documentary, this theories, the long form project, the writings that each of you were doing for mainstream publications and small journals. And I, and I just want to take this opportunity. I mean, really to, to thank you know, each of you for your contributions. I encourage everybody you know, viewing and, and listening um, to check out, you know, not just the, the you know, to rewatch the films that we just saw, but also the larger body of work. I think it's just such an extraordinary range and, and, and breadth of projects that it, it is at once a document of Los Angeles and Southern California at a particular moment, but really of sort of the US and the world and really just a, a moment in history that um, was, 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 was so rich um, and, and complex and has so many lessons and, and things to teach us for our current moment. So thank you all um, for joining in this conversation, this dialogue. And thank you again to Mark Quigley and the UCLA Film and Television Archive um, for convening this event, for preserving this work. Um, and thanks everybody for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. And, thank and you, just, Josh. Josh, thank you for your scholarship, your great book, and um, for moderating this for us. Amen. It was, it was a pleasure, an, an honor and a privilege. Thank you.
Great. And how lovely for the three of us to see each other. Oh, yes. <laughs>